Now this week, we have Pat Miller, making peace with impermanence. Is it possible to cherish the beauty of life, not just despite its perishability, but precisely because of it? Now we're going to join Kat in this talk to discover new possibilities when we make peace with impermanence at this time in our lives. Uh, Kat has an MA in spiritual psychology. You may know her as one of the better moderators of Open Circle. <laughs> she is also a counselor in Ahihikan Abroad. Her passion is aging free from ageism, living a day-to-day -day life and deepening her capacity and that of her clients to live freely and fully. She is currently co-creating a card game called Aging, the Inner Game. The video game can't be far behind. Please give a nice open circle, warm open circle welcome to Catherine. was, because I'm really surprised. I thought it was going to be me and five other people. Um, impermanence is not very popular. Um, we don't like it so much, other than when we do. So I want to uh, thank you all for being here. It's uh, wonderful to have you here. It's wonderful to get a chance to try out some of my ideas with you. So really, I'm doing this in conjunction with you. I've never spoke about this before. And uh, so I feel like we're in this together. And of course, I want to thank the Lake Chapala Society from what you could hear of Steve's announcements, you know, how valuable and thoughtful they are about how they bring us the uh, things that we all enjoy. So I really appreciate it to the Lake Chapala Society. So just to get a feel for the crowd a little bit, who's over 60? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, who here loves impermanence? Um, who here thinks impermanence is a problem to be uh, solved or denied? <laughs> Thank you, sir. One's willing to raise his hand. Okay. So um, what I would love while I do this talk is if you would pay attention to what you're experiencing inside your body or your thoughts or your emotions that arise, because I'm going to be using words like death, right, loss, grief. Um, I'm also going to be using words like awe and beauty and presence and compassion. But just notice how this sort of lands in your being. And I'm sure you'll distract and won't think about that, but every so often if you can kind of come back to your body and just see what the experience is like. Because this is a very important talk, talk, topic for all of us, uh, not just those of us that are older, but particularly for those of us that are older because we're sort of leading the way and, of course, we're coming to death sooner versus later. Which is, you know, seems kind of intellectual, but it's, it's actually real. So this is an incredible time of life uh, for the world that we're inhabiting, and we're doing this together with all of the world, and that's a very uh, unusual thing due to you know, our ability to communicate with each other through the internet in a variety of ways. We know what's happening in the world, and we know that we're in a co-joined um, experience of, of COVID and what that brings up, so we know that People all throughout the world are experiencing loss and grief and hopelessness and depression and children are in trouble and, you know, all kinds of things are happening, but we're doing that together. And so impermanence, of course, is, uh, we're steeped in impermanence and we're more noticing it as we go through COVID than we might normally notice impermanence. So this is a shared experience of the things come and go. Everything that has a beginning has an end. And um, we know that as elders, particularly more so than younger people know, because we've lived longer and we've had many things come and go. So I think this is also an opportunity as, for those of us that are older to share our experience with those that are younger than us and also to support each other in, re in the reminder and the remembering of that things come and go and that with great loss, sometimes out of the ashes comes the phoenix. So it's also an important time for us individually because we're, we are moving closer to death faster than you know, any other time. Though we could have died in, in utero, we could have died at four years old or 20 years old, but we didn't.
So we know, do know it's coming, and uh, I'll talk more about what that means in a little bit. I'm going to be using quotes from different people during this talk because I want us all, me included, to have the support of the wise ones we pretty much know. You'll probably recognize everybody that I quote. And um, so I just, they say, they're poets, they're, you know, they can say it so beautifully, so I'm going to be using that. So first off, what is impermanence? Okay, impermanence is the nature of every arising moment. Each moment, each life has never risen before and will never rise again. Everything that has a beginning has an end. That's what impermanence is. It's one of the laws of life, it's the nature of life, and yet we don't like it. And we'll talk about that pretty quickly. So what I'm curious about is what role does impermanence uh, mortality awareness play in living our life now. And that's what I've been studying for about the last four years, sort of what's, what's up with growing older and how, how can it be something different than what we've been conditioned to believe. So David White, the poet, beautifully puts it, this is the question for us today, how will we shape a life equal to and as beautiful and as astonishing as a world that can birth us, bring us into the light, and then just as we are beginning to understand this, take it away. So intellectually, I have known for ages, of course, that impermanence is the nature of life. But it was intellectual, you know, and occasionally I'd have an experience where I'd see it, but not really grounded. I even one time said, um, if I die, I actually literally said that to if I die, which, you know, would say that would be a, a denial of impermanence. It's a very good example. So, just like I've known that the earth is round and why the sky is blue, I knew. But as I've become older, I now know it experientially. And that's a very different experience, right? Because I can see it in my life. I can see it in other people's lives. I can see it in the world. And part of what comes up, of course, is fear. Because some things I don't want to change, and some things I do want to change, but I don't really have much say in most of it. I have some say. I might be able to choose what sandwich I'm going to have today for lunch, and things like that, which is great. But I don't have much say in what really what comes and goes. And so now I know it, and I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking, you know, you, you know it too. You're getting glimpses of it, or you're deeply seated in it. You might be deeply depressed by it, too. That's really possible. You might be in denial of it. You might be wondering, why am I listening to Kat speak about this? It just doesn't, it isn't relative to me. So the cultural denial of impermanence is big. If we were raised in ancient China, we would have learned that you know, life is 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows, and we would have recognized, we would have been brought up with that it's always, it's always changing. So um, why I wanted to do this talk is because I've been having what I call a love affair with impermanence, um, which is rather odd, um, I think. Um, I think it's moving more to a marriage now, but I want to describe the love affair. So, <laughs> you know, because love affairs are, you know, better than marriages. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, um, <laughs> um, so, like a love affair, how this kind of came about is I started to photograph flowers from birth to death. And um, what I was noticing, because I was interested in aging and how we age and how we have it picked out of what is beautiful, when's the ultimate time of life, when you're at your best, when you're at full bloom. And I wanted to uh, play with that. So I started photographing um, hibiscus in particular and release, and um, letting them mud and, you know, doing the whole thing from beginning to end and then dust. And I started to notice, one, my conditioning, that's beautiful. That's just, oh my God, that's perfect, of when the flower was the most beautiful. And then as I stayed with it, I started to fall kind of in love with each, each part of the, of the flower's life. And 
the conditioning of this is the right moment, or these are dead and I should take them out of my house. My friends would have to come in my house and they see, you know, a big bouquet of dead, hanging, dropping, dusty flowers, but they know what I'm doing. Um, so, impermanence was obviously there. The change is natural, it's going to happen, beginning, middles, and ends, and that each of each phase each moment of the flower's life and transferred into mine and yours is actually quite exquisite in its own nature, in its own self in any given moment. So that's where this kind of love affair started. So, you know, it started like, like it does, you know, with kind of a, a trembling and a, a, you know, like an interest and a curiosity and a feeling of being uplifted being seen, being gotten, being able to see yourself in a new light. It had those qualities of, of a love affair, of this, whoa, wow, who, oh, me, aha. Uh -huh. So it had the qualities of a love affair. So really, this love affair was kind of a, um, a, a meeting of four things. Uh, so the photography, the photography of flowers, um, being older, of course, um, which allows me and you to see from a larger picture perspective. We can see our lives from a greater height, um, uh, kind of look at all the puzzle pieces. If you recall when you were young, an hour took days. Or, you know, you could only, oh my God, I've got a pimple, what can I, I can't possibly, or I hate this job, it'll never end, you know. We can see actually how it's, how life actually goes. So from seeing that, and then just death pressing in on uh, all who, whom I love and myself, um, and then the study of ageism, which is helping me take off the blinders of denial and uh, what's bullshit about what we're taught, the conditioning of, of aging. So my current pet peeve, I won't go into it too much, but is in the stuff that's sort of woke about ageism, they talk about, you're the age you feel. So if you feel like you're 50 or 35 or 40 or 10, if you feel like you're 10, you kind of maybe need a therapist, but <laughs> you know, it's um, really, that's what it is to feel whatever age you are. So when people say, I don't feel 65, well, actually, you do feel 65. This is what it's like to feel 65 or 70 or 80 in your body, mind, emotion makeup. So I don't like that they're promoting, you might be this age, but you feel this age. So anyway, pet peeve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you have a little water here. Right? Thank you. So why is impermanence important to make peace with? Besides the obvious, that it's the nature of life. Or as Pima Chodron, the Buddhist monk, says, impermanence is a principle of harmony. When we don't struggle against it, we are in harmony with reality. I'm going to say it again. Impermanence is a principle of harmony. When we don't struggle against it, we are in harmony with reality. So, surprisingly, my research and uh, the research of my previous partner in this endeavor, Candace Luciano, and my current partner, Jolene, I mean, Johanina, Jolene, that's good, Johanina. Um, what we're looking at is we've been reading different studies and investigating, and this is what we're finding from also our personal experience, but also from the research. That happiness increases with the awareness that life is fragile and fleeting, what is now called mortality awareness. Facing the in inevitability of loss, grieving fully, and finding acceptance helps us savor life and feel compassion, which increases our happiness today. Gratitude for what matters most is easier to experience when life's fleeting nature is salient. Impermanence, peace with impermanence, gives rise to joy, presence, compassion, reverence, and awe. So we're going to explore these a bit. Because it, like, wow, that seems crazy. Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist monk also, 
It is not impermanence that makes us suffer. What makes us suffer is wanting things to be permanent when they are not. So if we don't make peace with impermanence, I want to talk about that a bit, we may find ourselves depressed, resentful, bitter. We might find ourselves feeling separate from life, deeply lonely, even if we're in partnership or with friends. We may find ourselves paralyzed between a wishful back, a wish things would have been different in the past. A cold. <laughs> a moment. We're not in Kansas. Not in Canada. Um, we may, if we're kind of wishing and stuck in the past, we might spend our energy there and miss the parrot flying overhead. <laughs> miss the presence, right? The present moment. We know what happens with worry and, and the rolling mind. So if we are involved in that, we may overlook what is here. In this case, the sunshine, the parrots, listening, distraction, all kinds of things are here. The brief, brief, beautiful moments that we have, also filled with sadness. Most of us, by this time in our lives, and I think it's unique to being older, I don't know, but we can walk out of somebody's memorial and, you know, feel deeply the loss of the person that that is died, and then in the next moment also be laughing and telling jokes. And there's some thought that that isn't okay, but that's actually a really good way. It isn't that you have to push away happiness in the depths of sadness, and you don't have to push away sadness in order to be happy. So it's, a, it's, it's an ability. I mean, I see people do it all the time, you know? Um, and uh, it, that's, that's natural. That would be the natural flow of letting grief in, Happiness in, a funny moment, a beautiful moment, deep sadness, sorrow. Studies show that any of the conditions of depression or resentment or bitterness um, can lead to a difference in our health, our longevity, and our well-being, and certainly our joie de vivre. So impermanence is a, uh, you know, it's important to make peace with, and it is very so I'm going to start with uh, this part of the talk with impermanent sex, because um, I want you to know that I am not going to minimize the loss, the grief, the huge things that have happened in all of our lives, the deep sadness, um, and talk about love and awe and inspiration, etc. I am going to talk about those things, but I want to start with really recognizing what has taken place in all of our lives. We can't be 65, 70, 80, 85, and have not experienced a great loss. So I really want to honor that. So impermanence is scary and heartbreaking. Eventually, one way or another, we're going to say goodbye to everyone we love. And that is deeply heartbreaking. Some of us are grieving the loss of youth. Some of us are excited about the, the loss of youth. Of course, divorce. Many of us have I've been divorced twice. Some of us have lost a home that we love. There's people who've moved here recently that lost their homes in the fires of California. We've lost careers, roles that we enjoyed, identities that were important to us. Some of us have lost our children. They've died before us. Some of us have lost our partners or spouses or friendships that were deeply important to us. So the list is on, you know, it's, we, could, we could scroll down like the old Star Wars movie, the first one where they just scroll through all the things. There's so much, right? Loss of physical capacities, what happens when illness strikes, yeah, unmade choices, unopened invitations. So a tremendous amount of loss. So, we're kind of a crossover generation out of our age, our ages here. So we may have uh, learned to be with sadness and heartbreak and loss um, stoically. Um, we also may have learned from our parents or grandparents um, sort of a denial, just get on, get on with it, um, buck up, stiff upper lip. Um, I didn't really realize that I might have been raised a bit like that until real recently. I took a course 
and uh, part of it was looking at grief and, um, and the loss of people in our lives. And it was a fantastic opportunity, and I think we can, we can all actually do this at any time, is I, I got to go back and kind of be with my father who died when I was 12. And I realized that I hadn't really grieved him deeply, that it was just sort of the momentum of the family. And I'm the youngest by 10 years. <laughs> um, and then I have a sibling 10 years, 12 years, and 15 years older than me. So I've, I've been able to go back and, and feel more deeply into it, to let my little person body, but also my adult body, actually feel the grief, cry, and also see how it's played out. You know, some of the, the strings that are tied into my being now are from the loss of my father. Um, I've also been able to do that with somebody who died, Candace, my, my aging partner, last year on January 1st. I've, I certainly cried then, I certainly felt her loss, but I've been able to go back and, and let myself sleep in it a little bit and not employ the way that I learned as a child or that, you know, was denial and moving on is really useful. It's very useful. I don't, I don't uh, denigrate it in any way. It's actually very appropriate. But there are times when we need to feel what we're experiencing and what it means to us. So that's my personal experience at this moment. So the studies show that if we face the inevitability of loss before it happens, if we grieve fully when it does happen, and we have an acceptance that life is going to do this, right? That's the impermanence piece then it helps us save our life, right, and increase our happiness today. So the studies say that people that do this, um, you know, they have a questionnaire and they've tested thousands of people and things, they are, they're, they're doing better. So what, we've, what we think of is, it's best if I just buck up and move on, don't feel, don't be sad for years, don't whatever, I'll be happier. But actually, if we accept our grieving and our sadness, we can be happy also. And we can let grieving and sadness and heartbreak inform our current life. In fact, inform our happiness, inform our choices. So, so if you grew up learning static and frozen as a way to do grief, you might want to say hello to it again. Because it's natural to grieve. Isn't it amazing that we cry? I mean, I think it's just like a trip. I mean, I know we cry when we cut onions, but we also cry with great joy and with great sadness. And many people do not believe they should cry. It's not a good thing. And it's just an amazing capacity of the body. So we can be with our sadness, with a loving kindness, with awareness. Right? We don't have to beat ourselves up or beat other people up or even get uncomfortable when other people are grieving, which most of us do. We don't know what to say. But if we just check in, we kind of know what to say. We can feel into the experience and, and know what is needed. So this says, my notes say, if we invite the pain into our heart where it can finally be integrated into our life as a source of wisdom, and a well of great compassion, and as a support to others. So compassion, well, we'll talk about it more in a little bit. This from Joan Halifax. When we face the difficult experience of loss, grieving can be like swallowing bitter medicine. Our whole being seizes up, and then something settles deep into our bones that gives us strength. So how many of you have that experience? What she's talking about? of this grief, allowing it to come in and allowing it to settle into your life and be part of your life. Okay? Thank you. <coughs> so mortality awareness. That's the new uh, groovy word for death. <laughs> Being aware that we're going to die. It's uh, death 2.0. It's uh, 3.0. It's uh, mortality awareness. So what happens if we open to the reality of our own death? It's a ponderous, isn't it? So what might your life, my life be like if we didn't fear death? 
This isn't to say not fearing how we might die or not having preferences of not dying right now, please much later. So preferences and fear of how we might die, that's fine. But what might it be like to not fear death? How might that impact our lives if we didn't fear death? Having done hospice work many moons ago and been around friends more recently who have died, uh, the difference between people that are afraid to die and people that are not afraid to die is pretty dramatic. Probably most of you have been around, maybe one or two of those, both sides of that. Um, people that are afraid to die will go to any extent to stay alive, um, will, um, you know, be scared. And of course, some fear is obviously natural. The unknown is scary. So that's not like to be like, hey man, groovy, dying. So it's not that. Um, there's a soberness to it, right? But it's important to us, for us to make peace with the, our dying because it will determine a little bit, unless we get hooked, you know, struck by a car or a bus, or here, any, you know, a lot of things could happen. And my favorite, I'd sort of like to die by avocado falling from the tree. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'll get to have my preference, but um, otherwise, we might know our death. It might be, it might show us, we might have time in front of it. And so if we can say hello to death, um, that it is coming, then we can also prepare a bit for it, right? We can do healthcare directives, we can talk to our friends and family, so that people know what's important to us. That's a whole nother talk. Hopefully you've come to see Loretta Downs, who goes into that so beautifully. So how many of you are afraid to die? And I know some of you won't raise your hand, it's kind of a vulnerable. Anybody afraid to die? The rest of you are good? Okay, well then, hey, I'm sorry for this whole last part. <laughs> Roque says, I'm not saying that we should love death, but rather that we should love life so generously, without picking and choosing, that we automatically include it, life's other half, in our love. So, with fear and denial of impermanence, the same results are that cynicism, bitterness, resignation, holding on, grasping for life, to be, to not change. It can look like perfectionism or heroism. So, we want to not have any of those things happen. And we, you've probably all, all of us have had the experience of older people that are bitter and resentful. And if you've had the opportunity, which maybe you didn't enjoy, of listening to why they are, you will hear them most likely speak about what didn't go right in their lives and what should have, how they were wronged, how, uh, you know, life did not do what they had hoped. And for, and for many of them, really deep traumas happen. So I'm not... Um, at all uh, making light of the possibility that, yes, life did go wrong, it did happen, bad things happened, deep, deep wounds were inflicted, um, or, or you were the inflictor of deep wounds. But the quality of bitterness and that is really about not really understanding that life is impermanent, and that it's always changing, and that it's not in our control. Some of it is, like I said, the sandwich making, etc. But some of it's not. So we don't want to have that bitterness. And it is a quality, um, people talk, uh, they, they put quality, uh, the qualities of bitterness and resentment and cynicism are usually, are talked about as with old people. So, you know, obviously it's a generalization and it's wrong and it also has some rightness to it. So we want to pay attention to that. So maybe some of you grew up with parents or grandparents or the next door neighbor that had that. And you can recall, what they spent their time on is, is the past. What went wrong and probably what's going to go wrong. Because once you swing into the past, 
you generally swing into the future. At least that's the way my I work. Pema Chodron. Somehow in the process of trying to not deny that things are always changing, we lose our sense of the sacredness of life. We tend to forget that we are part of the natural scheme of things. So how do we make peace with impermanence? We've got to make it fairly quickly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this talk is impermanent. I will be off the stage in a minute. Maybe even embrace impermanence. First, are you interested and willing? Right? You could be here at the talk and go, yeah, you know, kind of interesting. She speaks rather well, whatever. It's a beautiful day. Parrots flying over. But are you interested and curious? That would be unwilling. And then second is to recognize the cost of being in denial or at war with impermanence and uncertainty. So you can either look at through that the lens of your own life, you can look at through the lens of those you know or have known. So that's, this is sort of the same process if you wanted to work on anything in your life or if you wanted to deal with anguish, or you want to deal with the past, or your childhood. First you have to see, are you interested, willing, and curious? And then to recognize the cost that is happening in your life, and maybe your friends in your community, by being in denial. So then the next part is to recognize and stop trying to control. Yeah, I'm one of those there. <laughs> I can't believe you're doing this to my dog. How can you have me? That's what you don't want. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? I mean, my God, if we take parents for granted, yeah, we can have shitty life. Let me just say it strongly. No. Okay, so if we recognize and stop trying to control the uncontrollable, just a neutral um, um, sort of embrace of impermanence begins to happen, right? Because many of us, I, I certainly, I, I, I thought if I could perfect everything in my life, um, and I tried everything, uh, you know, people, myself, my personality, I mean, like, if it moved, I tried to uh, control and perfect it. Um, and then I discovered that didn't work, uh, which was a great time to discover that that didn't work. But um, if you're doing that, there is this fear of what will change, what will happen, how can I meet it? So you have to recognize and see, I can to control, and most of us at this age, it's one of the beauties of aging. How many of you control less now than you used to? See, I mean, look, it's natural with aging. It's one of the beautiful things of aging. Third is to give yourself over to the natural world by consciously partnering with nature. Parents. Right? So, um, our minds are so fantastic. Our brains, our ability to think the way we do, it's, it's a lovely thing to be able to think. But in our thinking process, what happens is that we see ourselves as separate from everything else. We're a separate individual, which of course we are to a certain extent, but we have this separate sense of that we live on the planet but we're not really like the trees and the plants and the flowers and the birds and the bees and the snakes and the dolphins and etc. But we actually are, even though our thinking mind says, I am different and I am separate. So one of the ways to um, most joyfully move into impermanence is to settle in to a walk or listening to the parrots or watching the sunrise or sunset on the lake and actually let yourself go, I, I am, I am part, I am this, I am nature, I am life. And then, of course, what's obvious is that everything is always changing, beginning and dying, beginning, middle and dying. And we're naturally, so to be held by nature, to be held by life, is an opportunity. And then the other is, you know, maybe from my talk will inspire this sort of, oh yeah, it's, it's natural. There's a rightness to impermanence. 
there's a beauty that comes. This is how we start to experience joy and awe and presence and compassion, is that time is limited. I have uh, kidney stones right now and wasn't sure I was going to be able to do the talk. And so I'm in a little bit of a heightened awareness of impermanence because, you know, Bill's ready to, you know, come on and Marty's going to drag me away if these stones move in this moment. But in that, I also have a sense of being really grateful that I'm here and that I have this moment with you and that up until, you know, right this moment, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do this talk. So I'm in a heightened awareness of it. There's a beauty to it. It's how we end up appreciating our partners when they make us just want to hit them. You know, it's like, wow, I'm with this person, and it's limited. And as we get older, we can see, and they may die before me. And that makes precious. It also could be a wish. God, I wish they would die before me. But that's, that's a different thing. So, I don't think I'm going to have time. <laughs> so the fourth thing is to uh, make peace with our past. And uh, if you haven't done so already, and it is an ongoing thing, there's no uh, like, oh, that piece with my past down, I'm good. But making peace with our past as it arises, because the past will arise in the present moment. So that's important. So, right. So I've spoken to, and I'm not going to go into, I'm going to say, Roque again says, is not impermanence the very fragrance of our day? So I was going to say the quality, I am going to say, the qualities of making peace with impermanence are joy, presence, compassion, reverence, awe, gratitude. Um, more other things too, but I think I've kind of spoken to them. A uh, reverence is just that deep appreciation when the awe arises to soak in it. Um, and you all know what gratitude is. And compassion is this that we are heartbroken and we are heartbreaking and we will die. And we and out of that humanness, being connected to everybody, to all of life, just naturally compassion arises. But if we're in denial of our impermanence, or we're in denial of our sorrow, or we're frozen in a time period of our lives, compassion may be not quite so available. So, in the face of impermanence and death, it takes courage to love the things of this world and to believe that praising them is our noblest calling. Again, we'll think. So I want to talk a little bit about my game that I'm creating. Will you stand up, Johanina? This is my game partner. We're gamers, man. <laughs> we create, we're creating. We've pretty much created the first um, draft, so to speak, of it. Um, Margaret Van Every's actually helped us, which is wonderful, and will continue to help us. Um, the game is about, it's a card game. Uh, it has no winner, no loser. It's about helping to dispel the myths of ageism. It's also a, an opportunity to see what's important now, how you want to live, what you'd like to bring in. What about forgiveness? What about philosophy? What about 